Hey everybody and welcome back to Jim's Garage. In this video I'm going to show you how to do TrueNAS virtualized in Proxmox. But before I get to that there's a few things that we need to discuss first. First I'm going to discuss the hardware you're going to require to do this. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the virtual machine that we need to create. And then we'll get into the steps of deploying an NFS and an SMB share that you can use within the rest of your network. And you know that I've used these extensively throughout my videos, so hopefully this will fill the missing piece of the puzzle. So the first thing that we need to discuss is the hardware. And to do this, you're going to need one of these. This is an HBA, a host bus adapter. But before we get into this, why do we need one of these? Well, if you've been using a bare metal TrueNAS installation, you're okay. That's because the operating system, TrueNAS in this case, has full access to the drives. And ZFS needs direct access to the drive to do its software raid. Now, if it doesn't have access to these drives, i.e. if we're using something like Proxmox, where if we have the drives connected to our motherboard through the SATA connectors, Proxmox will have control of those drives. So when we create a virtual machine, TrueNAS doesn't have full control of those drives because it's plugged into the motherboard. So the HBA provides a mechanism for us to do PCIe pass-through, i.e. we pass through this entire card just to the TrueNAS VM, and that gives it access to all of the drives that are attached on this end here. So what's the HBA and why do you want to use one? Well, one of the most simple reasons for having a HBA is because of these ports here. Now, these ports here, if you combine them with something like this, give you the option to add more hard drives to your machine. This could be particularly useful if you've run out of SATA connectors. Typically, you'll have something like four on a mini ITX, maybe six on a micro ATX, and possibly up to eight on a full-size ATX. It all depends on different chipsets and different manufacturers. But at some point, you may run out. That's especially true for my NAS where I have 15 drives. I've used the eight that are available on the motherboard and I've had to add an HBA to give me an additional seven drives. So that's one use case for having one of these. The second use case is what I just mentioned. Any drives that we attach to this port here or the other port, we can actually pass this entire card through to the virtual machine and therefore Proxmox will not have access to those drives TrueNAS will have access and thus that requirement for ZFS and the full software based RAID is possible because TrueNAS has direct control of those drives. Now before I go too far down this route and I'll tell you exactly which model this is and what I recommend and I'll also show you me installing this in a moment. It is important to note that Proxmox can actually do all of this for you without the need for TrueNAS. That's right, you can create SMB and NFS shares in Proxmox that are on ZFS RAID. That is a good option if you want to keep things minimal, but the reason I like to use TrueNAS is because I love the GUI and there's some advanced features that you can do in there more easily. Things like the scrubs are automatically set up to be automated. You can do that within Proxmox with cron jobs, etc. But I really like TrueNAS, so I'm going to be showing you how to virtualize it. So when buying an HBA, I always recommend going for the LSI cards. Those are the ones most commonly recommended on the TrueNAS forums, and they're kind of tried and tested. I've used one for a number of years without any problems, so I can attest that as well. This specific model here is the 9211-8i. There are other models. This one is actually about 11 years old, and that comes with some interesting challenges. Mainly this thing here, the heat sink. Because this is designed to be in a server with server grade cooling, i.e. very loud, very high airflow, it does get hot in a consumer case. Now, because I've got a couple of drives, I'm interested to see where this goes. And you can often see some interesting solutions on Reddit where people have strapped the mini Noctua fans on here. And that might be quite easy because there's a few holes punched into the PCB. So I could probably zip tie something on there. However, if you are looking for something, I do recommend you go with one of their newer models, just because with the advancement of technology, i.e. the die size is shrunk, so hopefully there's less power draw required and thus less heat that's needed to be dissipated. 
Anyway, have a look out there. There's a load of stuff on eBay in the secondhand market. And I would cross-reference that with the TrueNats forums where you can find a recommendation for all of the cards on there. I'll drop a link in the description below for that. But anyway, I'm going to hop over now and show you how to install this into a machine. And in a nutshell, what we're going to be doing is putting this card into the Times 16 slot in the motherboard and we're going to be removing the SATA connectors from the motherboard and instead putting them in here courtesy of this cable here which this end fits into one of those ports and these are just your common SATA cables that you've all seen a million times before. This obviously means that you can install SSDs on this if you wanted to. Okay so here you can see that the HBA has been installed and that's this card here in the top time 16 slot. Now as I mentioned earlier this has the ports on the back this means that this is an internal HBA. That means all of the cables for this will be routed on the inside of the case. You can actually get external where those ports will be on the back. Those are typically for servers that would have a JBOD attached to them. That's just a bunch of disks. But you can also get those pretty cheap on eBay because fewer people want them because what you'll typically have to do is route the cable out the back and then probably come back in through one of these PCI spaces here. It's not an elegant solution, but there's nothing wrong with it from a mechanical standpoint. It will work. So if you can get one of those for a steal, do go ahead and do it. Just make sure that those cables aren't touched and you can try and keep any nudges away from them. So the next phase that I have to do here is, you can see over here, I've got the SATA ports now going into the motherboard. These cables need to come out and this cable here needs to go into this port and these cables here, the two of them, need to replace the two that are already in the motherboard. So I'm going to show you what that looks like now. Okay, so now both of those cables have been taken out of the motherboard and it's time to take this cable here and plug it into the HBA. Then I'm going to take the other end of the cables, route it through and plug it into my hard drives. So now the cable is attached to the HBA here and that's routed back into the case and into the hard drives that I installed. And for those of you who haven't seen, this is the build that I put together in the past two videos. And if you want to go and see more about that and why I've chosen these components, go and check those out. Obviously with this setup, this cable here will support four hard drives and if you've got another cable you could support another four hard drives. There's also another 16 times slot in here that you can use. I think that's only a times four but this lane here can actually be bifurcated into two times eights. So you could actually split two cards in this one slot and have 32 drives off the single times 16 lane. So now we have the HBA installed and those drives connected to it. We're in a position where we can fire up this machine and see those drives. But I want to get on to how I'm going to virtualize this. So my choice of hypervisor is Proxmox. But this process should easily be replicated on other vendors such as ESXi, Hyper-V or whatever else it is that you're using. You simply need to know how to pass through the PCI card. So I'm going to assume that you've installed Proxmox for this video and if you haven't you can check out my earlier videos. I've actually installed this now with Proxmox on two drives in a mirror. That's going to give me some failover because this machine ultimately is going to be out in the field. Like I say I've spoken a lot more about this build in my previous videos. But let's jump into Proxmox now and let's discuss how we're going to set up this TrueNAS virtual machine. But quickly before we get on to that I just wanted to call out some of the advantages and disadvantages of going down this route. The advantages are pretty obvious. You've got consolidation. In the machine that I've built, I've put in lots of overhead to get this up and running with Proxmox so that I can run TrueNAS plus other virtual machines. That's great, but it does bear itself to one disadvantage. And that's chiefly that if you reboot Proxmox, you're going to lose access to your shares. And you'll probably want to make sure that you do a proper graceful shutdown of TrueNAS before you then reboot the host. Now that may or may not be an issue but it is something to bear in mind. 
Typically, if you enable this to start at boot, then TrueNAS will be back up and running as soon as Proxmos is, but if you do have users using it at the same time, they're going to get disconnected and you could risk some data loss or data corruption. So do bear that in mind. Anyway, back onto Proxmox and let's get this thing up and running. Okay, so here we are in Proxmox on a fresh install on the machine that I just showed you. And the first thing I want to do is to check whether those disks have been discovered. So to do that, we can click on the machine here, I've called it Ryzen, and then if we click on disks, you can see here that I've got the NVMe drive, this is where it's installed, and then I've got SDA and SDB, and those are four terabytes. So yeah, it's picked up the two disks that are attached to the HBA. One important thing I forgot to mention earlier is you will need an HBA that's in IT mode for this to work. So make sure that before you buy it, it's either pre-flashed or it has the ability to be flashed to IT mode. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. But anyway, let's crack on with doing the TrueNAS virtual machine. Now, I say TrueNAS because there's two options. You can do TrueNAS Core, which is basically the original TrueNAS, aka FreeNAS, or you can do the newer version, which is TrueNAS Scale. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. TrueNAS Core is based upon FreeBSD, which is another Unix-like operating system, and TrueNAS Scale is based upon Debian, the same as Proxmox and things like Ubuntu. And the two cater for different markets, or at least trying to. TrueNAS Core is basically what it says on the tin. It's the core NAS. Its function is primarily on being a NAS, albeit it does have the opportunity to have VMs, jails, and applications. TrueNAS Scale is a bit more down that path. It has things like Kubernetes, so spinning up applications that are replicated multiple times, like all of my Kubernetes videos. Now, because I've installed Proxmox, I'm specifically going to install TrueNAS Core. That's because I want it to do what it does best, run a NAS. And for anything else, things like Kubernetes or virtual machines or anything like that, I can fall back to Proxmox. That's what it's good at. That's what it's designed to do. Like I said before, you can install SMB and NFS directly on ZFS through Proxmox itself. But I want to use TrueNAS because I love the UI, I love the functionality, and I find it really simple to use. And I think the overheads of the virtual machine aren't too arduous for this setup. So let's dive into what the configuration looks like. The first thing you're going to need to do is go and grab yourself a copy of TrueNAS Core. You can do that by heading over to their website and just downloading. For this version, I'm using 13U6.1, which is the latest available version. But I don't expect these installation steps to change anytime soon. Once you've downloaded this ISO, you need to upload it to Proxmox or you need to give Proxmox the URL for it to go and download it itself. So I've already pre-downloaded this, so I'm going to click on the local. Then I'm going to click on the ISO images. This should be blank because it's a fresh installation. And then I'm going to click the upload button. I'll then select the file from my downloads. I'll open that and then click upload. This will upload from the machine that I'm currently on to the Proxmox server, and then we'll be able to use this as a media device when we create the virtual machine in a moment. Now that we can see that that's completed, task OK, let's get on to creating this virtual machine. So we're going to click Create VM, and in the bottom right hand corner, just make sure that Advanced is ticked because we're going to use some of these options during the wizard. So I'm just going to call this one TrueNAS. And it makes sense to start this one at boot because every time you start up your Proxmox server, you probably want your NAS to be available. Once you've done that, you can hit next. And then the ISO image, this is gonna be the one that we just uploaded. So select that one. Everything else on here can stay the same. For the system, it's important that we change this because for pass-through on Proxmox, it's recommended that you use a Q35 machine, which has all the latest benefits of UEFI. So on machine, we're going to click the drop-down, we're going to click Q35, and then for the BIOS, we're also going to change that to OVMF, which is UEFI. Once we've done that, you'll get an additional option for the EFI storage, which is kind of the keys. So we're going to click on that and just select the local storage you can obviously select whichever storage you want. You may have more than I do. Once we've done that, we're going to click Next. 
Now it's going to give us the installation location. So these aren't the drives that we're going to pass through. This is a virtual drive that TrueNAS is going to be installed on. So in my case, when I create TrueNAS and when it finally loads up and we go into the dashboard, we should have three drives. We've got this one here, which is a virtual drive, and then we've got the two physical drives that will be passed through via the HBA. Now, 32 gigs should be fine for this. You could probably dial it down if you wanted. I'm just going to keep it as 32 for this video. Importantly, we probably want to enable SSD emulation and discard. The SSD emulation will make it perform like an SSD, and that's important if you're running this from an SSD, like I am. And the discard, if you have trim, which pretty much all modern hard drives have, you'll be able to reclaim some of the deleted space from this virtual machine. So for example, if you deleted a gigabyte on the TrueNAS for, I don't know, let's say it did an update and then it deleted those files afterwards, it should be able to reclaim that space to be used again dynamically. So let's click next. Then we're into the CPU settings. Now, TrueNAS Core is pretty lightweight, certainly if you're gonna use it bare bones. I recommend you give it at least two cores. And for the type, we want to scroll to the bottom and select the host. This is going to give it all of the functionality that the host CPU has. And this can be useful for things like hardware acceleration, hardware offloading, certainly when it comes to things like drive encryption. Once we've done that, we're going to click Next. I'm going to untick Ballooning Device because it's recommended that for PCI pass-through, you have static RAM. So I'm going to untick that. Ballooning device means that it will keep requesting more memory as is necessary. I prefer to keep my RAM fixed because then I know what I'm working with, i.e. I know the total amount of RAM and I can divvy that up between each virtual machine. So the recommended minimum is 8192 or 8 gigs of RAM. And as you add more drives to it, there's a general rule of thumb that you'll add 1 gigabyte of RAM per terabyte of storage. Now, there's probably a bit of leeway on that. I don't know how true that is, but that's generally what's recommended in the documentation. I think that's because as you add more storage, it likes to cache more of that data. That probably makes less sense for a home lab where you probably only got a handful of users at most, but certainly in an enterprise setup, which this is kind of designed for, it makes sense that lots of different people can be accessing all of these files and as we know, RAM is much faster than a traditional spinning drive. It also helps relieve some of that wear and tear. So let's click Next. The network I'm going to keep as is. But if you're doing anything fancy with VLANs or you have dedicated NICs for this, you might want to have, say, a dedicated 10 gigabyte NIC or more if you're fancy for TrueNAS because it makes sense that you want your network storage to be nice and nippy. If you don't know how to do some of those VLANs and etc, I've got some videos on those. As I said, I'm going to leave this as is and I'm going to click next, which will take me to the confirmation page. Everything on here looks fine, so I'm going to hit finish. That's now going to go away and create this VM, and you can see it's being created up here. In a moment, this will change to TrueNAS, and here you can see all of the hardware on this machine. So, yeah, that looks good, but this isn't going to work if we just turn this on there's a few things we need to tweak. The first thing we need to do is click on Add, and we need to add a PCI device. Now, if you see this warning here, like I do, you need to make sure that you've enabled IOMMU. This enables you to pass through devices to virtual machines. I'll drop a link on the screen for where to go, and I also have a video on this that I did earlier where I pass through GPUs to virtual machines for gaming or any type of hardware acceleration. Things like Jellyfin and Plex do well with having a GPU available to them. Now that you've resolved any IOMMU options in the BIOS and enabled virtualization if necessary, you should be able to click on the raw devices and see all of the devices on your machine. For me, I need this one here, the Broadcom LSI. So I'm going to click this one here. I'm going to give it all the functions of the device. I'm going to leave the ROM bar as is, and I'm going to tell it that this is a PCIe Express device because it is. I'm then going to click Add, and that should show up here. So now we've got that PCIe device here, which we know from the video earlier, both of my hard drives are attached to. 
The cool thing now is if we go over to Proxmox on the left here for this Ryzen machine, and if I click on it and then I go to disks, you'll see that the other hard drives have now gone. That's because these are being sent to the virtual machine. So going back to this virtual machine, we need to do a couple of extra tweaks. We need to go to options and we want to look at the boot order here. So we want to click edit because we want the DVD drive to be the first, much like a physical machine when you're trying to install a new operating system. So I'm going to drag this to the top so it's going to look for that disk first. So hit OK, you can see that's reflected. And now you think we might be ready, but there's a couple of extra things we need to do. So we need to go to the console and we actually need to change the boot order within the UFE virtual machine. Remember, this is replicating UFE like on your physical machine. So we need to hit start. And when we hit start, we want to hit escape. So keep hitting escape. And then we come to this screen here, which is the virtual boot manager. So go down to the boot manager. Go down to secure boot configuration. And for my installation, or certainly my machine and most of the machines I've used, I always have to remove the secure boot option. So hover it over to the X and just hit the space bar. Press enter. And then in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that it says F10 to save. So I'm going to hit F10 and then I'm going to hit Y to save that. And then I'm going to escape, escape, and then I'm going to reset. This is basically like pressing the reset button on your machine. Now when we reset, fingers crossed, we go straight into the TrueNAS installation. Yes, this looks good. If you don't do this step, you'll likely get into the shell, the UEFI shell, and you'll just need to make sure that you follow the step I've just outlined. So now this is going to go through the initial installation steps. So let's see what that looks like. So sorry this is a little bit small, but we want to do the install upgrade. So I'm going to hit OK. And then, yes, we can see all three of the disks. So we've got the two drives here, 3.6 terabyte, that's those two four terabyte drives. And we've got that Quemu hard disk, which is the virtual one. This is the one that I want to install TrueNAS on. So I hit spacebar to put a little asterisk in there, and then I hit return. This is just going to give you the confirmation that it's going to erase all data on that drive. That's fine, it's blank, so I'm going to hit yes. I'm going to leave a blank password. We can create one when we first boot this up just for speed, but you can put one in here. Just remember it for later on. So to do that, we want to hit cancel. Not OK, a little bit confusing. And then we want to boot this via UEFI because we've set this up as a UEFI machine. And then it's going away now and doing the installation for TrueNAS. This will take a little bit of time depending on your hardware. So I'll see you on the other side. Also, with any look, it should detect that HBA card. So now it's got to the end of the installation process and there's a little trick that we need to do here. It's saying please reboot and remove the installation media. Now to get past this, we need to click on the hardware tab. We need to go to our DVD drive and we need to click remove. Now, when you click remove, it doesn't actually remove it now. You can see that it's got a line through it, which means that next time this machine shuts down, that's the crucial word here, and then restarts, it will remove that drive. So let's hop back into the console and we're gonna hit okay here. But instead of doing a reboot, because that will reboot the virtual machine, but it won't actually turn the virtual machine off for that drive to be removed. So we actually want to shut down the machine. That's gonna turn this off. And then we're going to go to the hardware tab and you can see it here this hasn't yet turned off yet we can see that that's now completed and we've got the start option come here and this green little tick here will disappear in a moment so now that's disappeared we know it's off and look what happens when i click start this should disappear so now when i click start that drive's disappeared. And now let's go to the console. And instead of going into the installation script, we should actually get into the first boot of TrueNAS. So I just heard my disk spinning in the background, so that's a good start. And I could also see the HBAs and the versions in the installation script files as well. Now that it's completed, everything is looking good. 
and we've been given an IP address to go and access this. And it's saying it's on 7.124 for me. So I'm gonna put that in my browser now and let's see if we hit the admin page. So here I've put the IP address in and with any luck, if I hit return, yes, we've got TrueNAS up and running, but we're not out of the woods yet. We need to make sure that those drives are passed through and they are visible. So as I said, if you haven't set a password, it's now gonna ask you to set one. So set a password or enter the one that you created during the installation. And now we're gonna sign in. So now that we're signed in, everything's looking pretty good. We've got the AMD Ryzen Pro because we set it to host so it can actually see and query what the CPU is. And we can see that it's got eight gigabytes of RAM and that it's ECC memory. Excellent. So let's go and see if we've got our disks available. So if we go down to storage on the left and then we go down to disks, we can see that yes, we've got the two four terabyte drives here and the 32 gig one, which is that boot pool. Brilliant, everything's looking good. So the first thing we're probably gonna to want to do is to create a pool. That's the precursor to being able to make any network shares. So over on pools, just above, we want to add. Now we're gonna create one, but bear in mind that you can import and it doesn't have to be imported just from TrueNAS. You could have created a pool with a different tool and you could import it into TrueNAS. There might be some nuances that you have to put in, etc. There might be some encryption, but generally speaking, this should be compatible across all ZFS infrastructure. So we're gonna click Create Pool. Now we need to give this a name. So I'll just call it TrueNAS, just to keep it simple, but call it what you want. You also have the option to do the encryption. And that should take advantage of the way we set the CPU to be host mode, because it should be able to offload hardware acceleration to the CPU rather than being emulated by an emulated CPU. I'm gonna use both available disks, but just bear in mind which ones you're choosing in case you've got more or you don't want to use all of them, etc. Hit this arrow to make them go over to the right, and then I can just click create. This is gonna confirm whether or not I want to create this because creating a pool with disks will destroy all the data on them. These are brand new drives, so hopefully there's nothing on there. There's certainly nothing that I care about. So this is gonna go away now and create that pool, and this should be really quick. I can actually hear the drive spinning up in the background, so that's reassuring. So now I can see that this has been created, and I've got three and a half terabytes of drive space free. Excellent. So now that I've created a pool, I wanna create a data set. And this is a bit like having a folder within the pool. So a pool is basically a pool of drives and you could have multiple virtual devices in a pool. So don't just think because you've got two devices here, two hard drives in this pool, you can't expand it. You could add more drives and create more Z volumes and add them to this pool to increase the storage size. So to create a data set, and you can have as many data sets as you want in a pool, I think, you can certainly create a lot. So we're gonna create a new data set, and I'll just call this one test to keep it simple. I'm gonna keep all of the defaults on. I don't want any encryption and things like that, but have a read through the documentation, and if you want this to be encrypted, turn that on and follow the recommendations that are in the documentation. I'm just gonna hit submit on that, and that's gonna go away now and it's created that test data set. So in its most simplistic form, this is now able to be shared via an SMB or an NFS. Now, since TrueNAS version 12, you can no longer use the root user as your only access to your shares. So what we need to do is to create a new user and then give that access or even ownership of the share we just created. So to do that, we wanna head over to accounts and we want to click users. We can ignore that message and then we want to click add a user. So for this one, I'm just gonna call myself James and I'll give myself the username of James and I'm gonna give myself a password. I'm just gonna put in James for this one. Do remember that because you're gonna need this to access your share later on. So now that's created, everything should be fine here. So now that's created, we can hit submit and that username is created, great. So now that we have our user created, there's one last thing we need to do before we can get the share up and running. 
and that is to head back to the storage, click on pools, and then the data set we created, we need to change the permissions. So edit permissions. And now we need to change this to have our user we've just created. So the owner of this is going to be James. So that should be at the bottom and is in the group of James as well, which should be at the bottom. And we want to tick this box to apply this user. So if you hover over the question mark, you can see that only these changes are made when this box is ticked. So I want to apply both of those. I'm also going to do apply permissions recursively. This shouldn't matter because there's nothing in there at the moment, but if you were changing permissions to an existing share, you'd want to make sure that all the folders are reflected. You can also do traverse. So that means that any data sets within this data set, that's right, a sub data set, it would also apply to. I don't need to do that because I don't have any data sets, but if you do, just understand that that option is available to you. So if we look at the permissions here, we can see that my user, James, is gonna have read, write, and execute. And that's fine, that's exactly what we wanted. If you want to, you can click use the ACL manager and this will give you more options. So here you can do things like set a preset. So you could have this open, restricted or home or you can create your own custom ACL. That's an access control list. I'm gonna create the custom one but I could have just accepted what was on the previous page but if you wanna go into a granular control, we can do it this way. So if you want to do it this way, we can see that there's three users here. I'm going to delete the other two because I only want to set this up for myself. I'm again going to change this to James. And at the bottom, I'm going to make sure I tick apply this user and apply the group. And then on the right hand side, who is this? So the owner is going to be the user and the user is going to be James. Everything's allowed, I've got advanced permissions, and I've got the ability to do everything on this drive. And for this flag here, I need to make sure that I inherit. Once that's done, I'm also gonna click apply the permissions recursively for the same reasons as before. Click continue, and then I'm gonna click save. Now, this should go away now and change all of the permissions for this data set. This now allows us to go to the share, which is down here, and create an SMB share. So I'm gonna click add, and then it's gonna ask, what do I want to share? Well, all of your pools and data sets are under slash mount. And here you can see the pool, TrueNAS. If you had more than one pool, you would see it at this folder level. Within TrueNAS, I've got the test with that ACL applied to it. And if you had more data sets within this pool, you would also see them at this folder level. So I'm gonna click test, and now that's populated. And then I should be able to click submit. Once submitted, you'll see that this is now on screen and it's enabled, yes. So with any luck, I can now hop into one of my machines. I'll demonstrate this on Windows just because it's simpler and I should be able to mount this to my machine. So to do that, and here you can see a sneaky version of how I record these videos and how messy it is. If you right click your this PC and then you do map a network drive, you'll get this dialog box. And this is gonna map it to drive Y. You can click this box and change it to any letter that's available. And it's gonna ask for a folder. Now for me, it's slash slash 192.168.7.124. You could also use a DNS name here if you've got it. And we know from up here on the back of the screen, it says test is the name of the share and it requires a share name. So I'm gonna put test. Now the box for reconnect at sign in is ticked and that means that every time your machine boots up it will automatically mount this which is probably the behavior that you want. Also we need to click connect using different credentials. If you're not using the same account or you're not using Active Directory etc you'll need to provide new credentials. Now this will be what I set a moment ago which was just a username of James and a password of James but you set this to whatever user you created within TrueNAS or if you want to tie this into Active Directory, I won't get onto that in this video, you could use those credentials. So I'm going to click finish now, and it's going to ask me to put in my password. Hopefully I can click remember my credentials, and when I click OK, it's going to load this on my machine. And now you can see that this drive is mounted under the drive letter of Y. When you're going through that for the first time, you might get a prompt to make sure that the SMB service is active. Obviously, that needs to be active, otherwise this won't be available. 
And if it doesn't pop up for whatever reason and this isn't working, just make sure that over here on the left, you click services and you make sure that SMB is enabled and you probably wanna make sure that that starts automatically every time you reboot TrueNAS. So now you have an SMB share on your Windows machine and if you install things like SIF utils, for example, you can go and install this on things like Ubuntu, etc. So let's jump into NFS now and get that up and running. Now, NFS is different to SMB because it's a volume share, not a file share. And because of that, it's recommended that you create a new data set for this. Otherwise, you're going to have a bit of a permissions nightmare because NFS likes to lock files, etc. So add a new data set, and this one can be under the same pool as TrueNAS. I'm just going to call this one NFS-test. Leave all the options as is for now and hit submit. That will create the new one here. So you can see NFS test. You could obviously change all the available storage if you wanted to, if you wanted to restrict this to a maximum of say one terabyte, etc. But now that we've done that, we want to create a share. Now, thankfully that's the same process as before. So if we go down to sharing, we want to click on NFS and then we want to hit add. Now I'm just going to keep this one really simple. So I'm going to go into mount. I'm going to go into our pool of TrueNAS and I'm going to select the NFS test share. I'm going to specify all directories and quiet. And if you wanted to go to the advanced options, you can restrict this to specific users. I'm not going to do that for this tutorial, but do note you could change it to the user, for example, we had before. With all of that just left as default, I'm going to hit submit. When you do that, it might ask you to enable the service if it's the first time. So go ahead and do that. And it might be worth checking just in services that NFS is enabled and to start automatically. You may also wish to go into this and configure it and change this to number of servers. It's typically on 16 by default. I've dropped this down to four without any performance issues. And I've also enabled NFS version four because it has more advanced features. You can leave it as three if you want, but I recommend you put it to version four and then hit save. Now that we've done that, let's hop over into a Linux terminal and try and mount this drive. So here we are on one of my RKE2 admin machines, which I've used in a previous video. And there's just a couple of things we need to do to get this running. The first thing we need to do is to install the necessary dependencies. So sudo apt install, and then we need nfs-common. This will go away and pull all of the necessary tools to be able to mount this. Once that's installed, we're going to require a folder where we want to mount this just like any other Linux mount. So now that's completed and you might need to reboot if there are certain services that need to be restarted, we want to create a folder. So I'm just using the example sudo make directory and I'm going to put this in slash NFS. So this is a root folder on the device that it'll be using to mount the NFS share we created in TrueNAS. So now I've done that, we need to do another sudo and it's a sudo mount and we need dash T for type of NFS. We then need to specify the IP address, which is 7.124. Then we need a colon because we need to specify where this is in TrueNAS. And we can remind ourselves of where this is. If we go to sharing, we click on NFS and we can see that it's slash mount slash TrueNAS slash NFS test. So we need to write that in here. So slash mount slash TrueNAS slash NFS dash test. And then we need a space because we need to tell it where to mount it on this machine. And that was simply slash NFS. Now, when I run this and make sure that you've got any firewall rules in place to enable it, we should simply hit return. That's now completed without any error messages. And now if I do a DF dash H, I should see this here. And yep, I do, I see the mount at the bottom here and I've got 3.6 terabytes available, which is what we expected. So great, we've now got SMB and NFS enabled. So hopefully now you've got everything you need to virtualize TrueNAS. We've discussed the hardware that's required and how to actually plug that stuff in. We've talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages of using TrueNAS in a virtualized environment. Plus we've talked about the configuration of the VM itself and I've showed you how to create a pool and data sets and even SMB and NFS shares. So this should give you a comprehensive package that you can deploy in your home lab and give shares to everybody on your local network. 
This is really useful because this is ZFS mirrored storage, so it's got some built-in redundancy, which is great for your important files and chiefly backing up things like your home lab itself. Let me know if this is something that you're gonna do or whether you're gonna stick with just the bare metal installation of TrueNAS or hey, maybe even just use Proxmox shares themselves. Anyway, if you've liked this video and found it useful, please give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.